Good morning. Welcome here, family. And for those of you who are new, thanks for coming. Welcome here. I'm not a pastor. I'm not the pastor. And I don't know how to work this. Oh, there we go. Fake it till I make it. Was, was that Hank? It was. Wow. Oh, I'm supposed to do this. Can I do this now? I got to do it slow. Oh, it's one of those two. It looks so easy when Clint does it, eh? Well, I'm wearing a tie today. This was two challenges. One, I was challenged to wear a tie by Dan, because I love a challenge. And then two, it was a challenge to actually wear a tie. Now, I, I haven't worn a tie in years. However, I prayed about it. I put it on. I tied that Windsor knot and put it up one try. Amen. Like that, right? So, is our God not good? Right? Miracles do happen. Oh, miracles do happen. Thanks, you, huh? I'm reserved and quiet. So, by that laughter, you can tell that's not the truth. I'm not reserved, and by the response of the people that know me, I am definitely not quiet. <laughs> but what you see is what you get, right? Today you get a tie. Not next Sunday, I'll tell you that. I was born into a family of four kids. I was the only boy. And I would have been what you called a busy child. Uh, and I haven't slowed down much. Um, my back is sore today. And I don't think it was a woodcutting yesterday. We went to... Max and Bill's last night, because Max turned, sorry, Bill turned 85 years old, and that man knows how to party. <laughs> he is something else. My greatest endeavor in life was to make my sisters laugh. And I found that timing was very, very important. I regarded it a great accomplishment if I could get one of them to spray milk out their nose. <laughs> or loud snort, chuckle, a little bit of laughter at a quiet performance like a concert or a play. And if I could do both at the same time, oh. I was in great form. However, my greatest challenge, and I let you know that I love challenges, was to get them to laugh out loud in church during the sermon. I probably required adult supervision as a child. And if you talk to Charlene, I probably still do. Yeah, these are the people that know me. But with my dad as the pastor and my mom sitting at the organ in church, I didn't have adult supervision. So ultimately, it wasn't my fault, right? Do you know what it's like to be talked to from the pulpit? When, they, when my dad said, Tim, that's enough. Oh, that's pretty rough. It didn't slow me down at all. My folks tell a story of when I was six years old in church in rather great form. 
Hey, Richard. Hi, brother. I didn't see him when he came in. Anyway, so I was in great form, six years old, in church, sitting alone with my three sisters, and mom marches down the aisle from the organ, throws me over a shoulder, and carries me out of the sanctuary. Just before we reached the back doors, I called out, pray for me. Even as a child, I recognized the power of prayer and our need for it. Now, my mom didn't have big hands, but boy, could she wallop. She was good. I've named this message, Living Our Best Life, and how it takes more than just prayer. A short time after Pastor Clint asked me to take this message, the Holy Spirit gave me the subject. I prayed, I read, I studied, I took notes, and I knew this was going to be a deep subject for me. When I finally came up with the title, I was really torn. I struggled with whether I should keep it or not, what it would sound like, living your best life but I decided to stick with it. We're certainly not living a life as grand as it will be in heaven, but we are able to live our best life now. Let's put up 1 John 5, 18 to 19. Now, I had a lot of help with this. Um... Satan really worked hard against me this week. My printer wouldn't work. Uh, I lost PowerPoint on my computer. I lost Word on my computer. And still God put it together. Kim helped. Bryce helped. Catherine helped. And they got a PowerPoint up for us. So I'm not working out of one scripture. We're bouncing all over. So let's read 1 John 5, 18 to 19. We know that anyone born of God does not continue to sin. The one who is born of God... Dion, thank you, my brother. That's love, isn't it? The one who is born of God keeps him safe, and the evil one cannot harm him. We know that we are children of God, and the whole world is under the control of the evil one. So that comes from the Bible. If the whole world is under co control of the evil one, and we are to be in the world, but not of the world, as we see in John 17, can we still enjoy ourselves? The Puritans of the 16th century didn't think so. If you know anything about them, they pursued a serious and continual sense of worship with God, believing they were saved through the law. They weren't known for, to find happiness in life. And it was probably not just because their doctrine of the law, but also the hardships of living in those days. In John, he wrote the prayer of Jesus, they are not of the world as I am of the world. Being of the world means following the world's values and beliefs and living an ungodly life. Christians are supposed to run from these things and follow the examples of Jesus Christ. We are to be that example. Not to be greater than anyone else, but to model Christ. As a Christian, we are supposed to be modeling Christ. We are no longer ruled by sin and no longer bound by the principles of this world. As believers, we should stand apart from this world and not engage in the sinful activities that this world promotes to be good, clean fun. But can we live our best life?
it doesn't just take laughter. I love seeing people smile and laugh. And that's probably why I'm a big goof. Because I like to see people smile. But is that living my best life? Let's read Romans 12 too. What do these look like? Oh, you guys did great. Thank you. Romans 12, 2. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. We are to be transformed, and our minds are to be like that of Jesus Christ, to do His will, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. This doesn't mean we can't enjoy ourselves, and this doesn't mean we can't live our best life. On the contrary, I think we can live our best life right now, but many people don't. Many Christians don't. When a person hears about living their best life, the first thing that comes to mind is having an abundance of material things. Having a great paying career, having everything they want when they want it. Isn't that right? When you think about living your best life, doesn't that come to mind sometimes? Paul's letter to the church in Philippi is a wonderful example of the love of Christ. While in prison in Rome, Paul thanks the Philippian church for the gifts sent to him, and he reminds them that God will meet all their needs when they are faithful. So let's look at Philippians 4, 19. And my God will meet all your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. This is how Paul ends his letter to the Philippians. Now the conditions in the first century Roman prisons were torturous at best. The prisons were underground. They were crowded, dirty, and built to be uncomfortable. Often prisoners were chained together in the exact same cell just to make it hard on them. There was no basketball in the yard, no TV privileges, and definitely no chicken nugget Wednesdays. This was a rough place. While I was in missions in Nicaragua, I witnessed two prisoners. And I was appalled. The cells were crowded. There were no seats and no beds. Too many men stood, sat, slept in the same smelly cell. You can imagine where they went to the bathroom. Families would bring gifts to them, like they did with Paul. The gifts were of food and money. The one meal a day that the prisons provided wasn't enough. Fees and fines had to be paid for before that prisoner was either released or executed. And those conditions are similar to what Paul went through, even today. Does it sound like Paul was living his best life while he was in prison? Certainly not according to the world's definition. Yet he thanked God for all his provisions. Paul didn't complain about the treatment he received and reminds us the need to be content in whatever our circumstance. God will meet all your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. What assurance, amen? What assurance. But let's have a look at what needs are. 
Needs are the necessity of life. Is comfort a need? No. Paul couldn't have been comfortable in prison. How about a new truck? Is a new truck a need? I got a no over there. I love that. He wants a sports car. <laughs> How about nice clothing? A need? Is family a need? Even family's not a need. Family's a gift. Is the joy of fishing a need? No. Some of us may think so. But we too often mix up the desires of our hearts with needs. Yet, God still wants to us to enjoy them to the fullest. Our God is great. Not only fills our need, the promise that He will give us our needs, but He also supplies the needs and the desires of our heart. We need to find contentment in all situations, and in contentment, we find joy. And I love joy. I love to see people smile. This week, I was able to visit with Randall and Catherine Scott. That's Catherine Scott back there in front of the computer screen. If you don't know her, she is a patient lady if you know Randall. And he is a wonderful brother. Randall is an outdoorsman, loves being in the wilderness, and he spends as much time outside as possible. Several weeks ago, he injured himself in a fall at home. He fractured his ankle, fractured his leg, and he's gone, undergone surgery. And that surgery appears to have gone well. But now is the time of healing. He is not able to bear weight on that leg for many more weeks. Can you imagine that if you love the outdoors so much? He missed our men's retreat to Bella Coola fishing. That must have hurt. When I arrived, he was sitting in his easy chair, both feet up. It was, it was nice to see. I think they have four easy chairs in the front room. I didn't, I didn't put my feet up. I thought that was just too much. So. But that, that's how he spends most of his days now. So, while chatting, I realize that he is in his own prison. It's not a prison like Paul went through. He's not sitting in somebody else's urine. But it's a prison nonetheless. Especially for a guy that just wants to be outside. Does it sound like he's living his best life? It really doesn't, does it? Definitely not to somebody who values worldly desires over godly ones. But how is Randall reacting to his prison? What a blessing. He isn't complaining or blaming God for the tough times. He thanks God and praises Him for His goodness. He has been gifted more time to spend in the Word. By his chair, he has a worn-out Bible and several notebooks that he writes in with what he calls jewels of wisdom from the Word. So not only is he reading, he's trying to understand, he's studying, he's writing it down. It's a beautiful thing to see. Randall's spending his time with his God. And the time I spent with him and Catherine was an encouragement to me. Randall has found contentment in his circumstances. A circumstance that he didn't foresee In the same letter from Paul, 
in Philippians, he tells the church of Philippi the reason to refrain from complaining. Let's have a look at that, Catherine. Philippians 2, 14 to 16, please. Do everything with com without complaining and arguing so that you may become blameless and pure, children of God without fault in a crooked and depraved generation in which you shine like stars in the universe as you hold out the word of life in order that I may boast on the day of Christ that I did not run or labor for nothing. Paul is saying that by avoiding complaining and arguing, we stand as shining examples of God's peace and joy. And when we cling to the word of life, our radiant faith will be a beacon guiding others to the truth of the gospel. So not only is it words that we say, it's our actions. It's who we are. If we can do things like this, we can be a witness even when our back is turned. Living our best life is a choice that we have to make. Now, it's not a perspective. No, I'm not talking about the power of positive thinking. The choice I'm talking about is strengthening our relationship with God. Do you get up in the morning and complain about your sore back? Aye, aye. Or do you just take the ibuprofen? I thought it'd be funny if I brought a bottle of ibuprofen today. It would have been great. But I took them all this morning. <laughs> do you complain about the amount of work you have to accomplish in a day? The amount of frustration it is to get a kid like me ready for church? How about the realization that your family is coming this weekend for their yearly visit? I... <clears throat> Or do you thank God? Did you thank God at 2.30 in the morning when you wake up to pee? Or did, or did you grumble about the small bladder and having to get out of bed again? Think of this. It's better than the alternative. Not waking up at 2.30 in the morning to pee. Because eventually you'll wake up. Did you know that scientists don't even know the process of how the bladder tells the brain to wake up? And yet, God built it in you. That alone is reason to praise God and to be thankful. I'd have sheets on my bed all the time. I'm up several times a night. In Paul's letter to the Thessalonians, he teaches them the power of the gospel. The church is grieving over the death of some of its members, and Paul reminds them that our God has conquered death, and the grave holds nothing over on us. He will not neglect the believers who have passed. Our God will raise them from the dead, just as he raised Jesus. And Paul encourages them and instructs the church to rejoice and be thankful, even in the face of grief. So let's have a look at 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 to 18. Be joyful always. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances for this is God's will for you. Paul doesn't say, thank him when things are going well. He says in all circumstances, the good, the bad, and the ugly. That's the title of a Clint Eastwood movie, by the way. I'm going to try to work one of those in every time 
Clint asked me to preach. Next time it's going to be two mules for Sister Sarah or something. Clint Eastwood fans. It is much harder thing to do. But by doing that, by being thankful in all things, we are truly being thankful, not just saying the words. So we can't just get up at 2.30 and go, oh, thank you, God. Our heart has to be in it. Thank you, God. Truly being thankful is to know God's will is perfect. Nothing I do or say is better than His will. It's definitely not enough. But with Christ, what I put in, He makes great. Or good. Or better. But not, not always lousy, I'll tell you that. Because if this was me up here, I wouldn't be able to get through it. These are his words. The Holy Spirit had me up to one o'clock, several nights. Well, I guess that's in the morning. Because of what he spoke. His love for us is pure and complete. And he doesn't want us to struggle. Well, let's look at Proverbs 3. I think it's four and five or five and six, something like that. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make your paths straight. Where would you rather be? Stumbling around in your own decisions or walking in his will? on the straight paths He has made for you. That's where I want to be. He wants us to be comfortable. He wants us to be happy. He wants us to be content in where we are. Most of us have a desperate need to control and to know everything that's going on. I'm not one of those people. Who left? When we went to Europe, Shar allowed me to plan our trip. You're shaking your head. You don't want me to tell this? <laughs> she hasn't heard any of this. Shar loves to plan things and, and know where we're going to be and what we're going to do and stuff like that, so we planned our first night and that's it. Everything else was going to be up in the air. Woo, that didn't work. But that, in a sense, is control. My control. The way I wanted it to be. However, God had a different plan. And I'm not going to tell you the end of that story. At least to say a 19-day trip turned into a six-day trip. Not because we argued. But I'm not going to tell you why. His way, that'll be next time. His way is better than ours. Even when our way is the only way we see. Let's look at Isaiah 55. In Isaiah 55, God's call is for the lost. It starts with, come all you who are thirsty, is how that Isaiah 55 starts. And then verse 8 and 9 say, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. God's letting us know that we have no control. Our control is to give God control. And that's it. 
God sees and controls the whole picture, while we see and think we understand the very corner, the very little bit that we see, which is nothing. We have to learn to give Him the control. So let's have a look at Romans 8, 28. And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love Him, who have been called according to His purpose. We know that in all things God works for the good of all who love Him. Wow. Does that ever speak to you at 1 o'clock in the morning? When you're tired, you shouldn't have been drinking coffee. We most often will not understand how God is working for the good of all who love Him. But when we accept His agenda for ours, when we pray for His will, not ours, He will never fail us. If we trust Him with our whole heart, there is no room for doubt. We don't have to know what's going to happen tomorrow. We can plan tomorrow, but we have to have the ability to let God do God. And if we truly thank Him, our relationship with Him grows. So if we have gratitude in all things, do we have praise in all things? Let's look at that. Praise is lifting God up and acknowledging His greatness. And praise is why we were created. Did you know that? God created us for our praise to Him. In Isaiah 43... The Lord is speaking of the Israelites' unfaithfulness while traveling through the desert after being freed from Egypt. If you read Exodus, the story of the Egyptians coming out, uh, sorry, the Israelites coming out of Egypt, why weren't they thanking God all the time and praising Him? Instead, they were doing silly things like worshiping idols and grumbling complaining about the food. Yet, God provided their food every single day and their water. Isaiah 43, 21, sorry, 20 to 21, please, Catherine. The wild animals honor me, the jackals and owls, because I provide water in the desert and streams in the wasteland to give drink to my people my chosen, the people I formed for myself, that they may proclaim my praise. So we've got a lot going on in this, these two verses. God created His people, that's us, that we may proclaim His praise. Yet the Israelites did not honor Him, but the animals did. The animals benefited from God providing for His people. And yet, they did not honor Him and thank Him. And we do that too, way too many times. Praise fulfills His purpose for us. It strengthens us and increases our faith. In this world, it is so easy to become distracted with so much going on. But when we praise God, our focus is shifted to Him where it should be at all times. What kind of idols do we worship in the presence of God? It may not be a golden calf, but what is it? 
God is worthy of our praise. And we can praise through prayer, through singing, teaching, and loving one another. Catherine, could we turn to Hebrews 13, 15, please? Through Christ, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruits of lips that confess his name. I found this one really interesting. The author of Hebrews is encouraging the persecuted Christians of the first century to hold firm to their faith in Jesus Christ. Animal sacrifice is no longer necessary because Jesus has already bled and died for our sins. So the sacrifice of praise is an offering, our offering of faith. Now, it's easy to praise God when things are rosy, just like thanking Him. You know, when things look great, thank you, God. Praise you. But when things are not going well, do we praise Him? Do we thank Him? Do we raise our hands up and say, praise you, holy God? And that's what we have to do. Bad news loss in the family, financial issues, and when we think God doesn't hear our prayers, that's when praise becomes a sacrifice. Well, that's funny. I numbered these this morning. I'm sure I did. It's hard to praise God when our world seems to be crashing around us. All we want to do sometimes is scream at Him. You don't hear me. Why did you do this? But this is the very time we need to praise God. That's the sacrifice of praise. The sacrifice of praise is when we praise Him even if we don't feel like praising Him and we truly praise Him. That's our sacrifice. It's an expression of our reverence to Him. The acknowledgement of who God is and what He has done for us. He's our creator and worthy of our praise all the time. I'm going to sneak it in one more time, the good, the bad, and the ugly. At all times. Now we've looked at gratitude. We've looked at praise. Now we've come to a fundamental problem in the Christian church. We have it in this church. Submitting to God. Now, if you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, then you have submitted yourself to Him. You have salvation through Jesus. However, surrendering is not a one and done in a Christian walk. It's not a one-time deal. You won't lose your salvation. But how often do we fall away? How often do we walk away from Jesus Christ? I've done it over and over and over and over and over and over again. And every time he accepts me back like the prodigal son and puts a signet ring on my finger. Every time. Praise God. Without continually surrendering, we are telling God that we can handle it. We don't need Him. And we all know what it's like without God in our lives. And if you don't remember, look around at this world. When we look around at this world, do we really see that man can do anything good on his own? Not at all. We need God. We are nothing 
without him. Let's go to James 4, 7, please, Catherine. Submit yourselves then to God. Redes resist the devil and he will flee from you. I love this verse in James. Who doesn't want that kind of power on their side? Resist the devil after submitting to God and he will flee from you. Wow. That's what I want. If you didn't submit to God this morning, you can now. If you don't just feel like it now, then this is actually the time to submit. When we submit to God, we're given everything over to Him. Not just one daily, but hourly. In every situation, we need to submit our life to God. You are the reason you're not living your best life. You've allowed separation between you and God. What is that separation? God wants you to surrender Him in all things. Have faith that He will place your feet on solid ground and steady you as you walk along. Living your best life is having a loving, meaning relationship with God. Thank Him, praise Him, and surrender to Him in all things. Whether you're here whether you're listening online and you find it difficult to find hope in your situation, if you're in your own prison, in your own chains, and you need help, you can add freedom through Jesus Christ right now. He doesn't promise you'll never experience trials, but he does, does promise that he will be with you and never leave you. And when this life is over, he promises eternal life with no pain, no hunger, and no shame. If you feel Jesus calling you, tugging at you, knocking at the door and you want to commit to him right now I'm going to give you the chance I'm going to say a prayer and you can repeat it it's not a magic prayer but if you truly mean what you say you will gain salvation and can start living a life, your best life, with Jesus Christ. Let's bow our heads. Forgive me, Lord. I'm a sinner, and I don't want to be separated from you any longer. I know you came and died for my sins and were raised again so I could have salvation. Jesus, I surrender to you and accept you as my Lord and Savior. Amen. Now, if you prayed that prayer, welcome to the family. You have salvation. I would suggest you find someone who is a Christian and let them know what you've done today so they can help. Because the road's not always easy. But God promises us a straight path. Find a Bible somewhere and start reading it. Join a Bible study if you can. You are brand new in your walk with Jesus. 
So talk to a pastor and ask questions. As a Christian, the Bible promises that death has no hold on you. You don't have to live the way you've been living. Let's read our uh, passage, please, Catherine. Ephesians 4, 22 and 24. You were taught with regards to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful nature. To be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. You can change the old way you lived. What you did and how you thought to the new way, the way that God has for you to live. He knew you from the very beginning and called you by name. He knows the number of hairs on our head. Mine keeps changing. But he knows that. What a comfort. Not that he knows how many hairs are on my head, but that he calls us by name. If you didn't, say the prayer with us. And you have questions, please reach out and talk to somebody. This is about your eternal life with Jesus Christ. If anyone in the congregation wants to pray with somebody now, we've got a couple, Cal and Ingrid, that are going to be in the prayer room after we sing our last song. And I want you to come up and pray with them. If you have questions, come up and ask them. Be thankful. Praise God and submit to Him. Live your best life, the best life you can with Jesus Christ today. Amen.